We are back. Let me begin by saying good morning to everyone joining from the United States. And of course, uh, good evening to those joining from the Kurdistan region, Iraq, and from across the Middle East. I'd like to welcome you to day two of the U.S. Chamber's virtual conference, post-COVID-19 economic priorities in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Of course, this conference is being done in close partnership with the KRG representative to the United States, Bayan Sami Rahman. I'm Steve Lutz, president of the U.S. Chamber's U.S. Iraq Business Council. Yesterday, we were honored to hear from Masoor Barzani, the prime minister of the Kurdistan regional government. He spoke to the important efforts and reforms being championed to attract uh, U.S. investment to the Kurdistan region. He emphasized how important the energy sector has been and will continue to be, while also speaking to the need to diversify the economy and the role that American businesses can play across a real range of industries. We also heard from a number of U.S., Iraqi, and KRG officials and American business leaders who echoed the importance of those themes. Today, our conference lineup will continue to explore these themes as well as the importance of addressing issues affecting the business environment with the goal of developing a more transparent and predictable climate that empowers entrepreneurs and encourages an investment and job creation. I want to thank you, Bayan Khan. Uh, it's really going to be difficult to top uh, day one in the stellar lineup we had, uh, but I think we're going to take a good run at it here with day two. So Bayan, if I can, let me please turn over to you for your opening comments. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, everybody here in America. And good evening to those watching in the Middle East and especially in Kurdistan region. Uh, as you say, Steve, we had a great uh, day one of the conference uh, with the Prime Minister, of course, speaking, and then the Deputy Energy Secretary from the United States. A lot of very interesting, insightful discussions. A lot of focus on diversifying uh, away from oil, not relying completely on oil. Um, today, uh, we have uh, another excellent lineup of speakers. Our first speakers will be uh, His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister, Kubat Talabani, with Joey Hood uh, from the State Department. Uh, many friends in Kurdistan and Iraq will know Joey from his time uh, at the embassy in Baghdad. Uh, others will know him from his other postings in the Middle East. I think that'll be a very interesting uh, discussion to kick us off today. Um, but other panels today, we have one panel focusing on economic priorities and also what the investment board is doing to attract investment and make it easier uh, to uh, register your investment uh, for your investment license. Uh, now, we keep talking about diversifying away from the economy, uh, from oil. Uh, so we do have the agriculture minister who will speak about food security today. And I think that's really critical for us. Um, but the reality is that today, oil uh, and gas really are the backbone of our economy. And so we wouldn't be able to have a, a conference on investment and the economy of Kurdistan without talking about energy. And we have an excellent panel uh, focusing on that. Matthew Zais from the US Department of Energy will be heading that discussion or moderating that discussion. Uh, and we have uh, uh, somebody from Chevron, from Hillwood and from Car Group uh, in that panel. And then we also have uh, the DFC, which uh, really provides funding for investment projects abroad. Uh, this is a US uh, lending facility facilitator. Um, so it's great that we will also have a way of financing all of this investment that we're talking about from the US into Kurdistan region. So, as I said, we had an excellent day yesterday, lots of very, very insightful, very honest discussions, and I expect the same today. Uh, so, very excited about that. One last word from me, Steve, uh, before I hand over back to you. I really want to give a shout out to the Kurdistan Chambers of Commerce. Uh, we have Chambers of Commerce in Erbil, Suleimani, Duhok, and Halabja. Uh, they have always been so cooperative with our mission 
here in Washington. I know you have, as the Chamber of Commerce in the US, you have an MOU signed with them. So I just want to recognize how helpful they've always been and uh, what great representatives they are for the Kurdistani business community. So with that, I will hand over back to you, Steve, and I wish everybody a very successful conference. Well, thank you, Bayan, and I would echo your uh, your statement on the Kurdistan uh, Chambers of Commerce and Industry. They are great partners. And we have a, a great way, I think, to start off the second day uh, of our conference with a discussion on enabling the drivers of economic growth. Um, as Bayan mentioned, I think uh, two dynamic and strategic leaders, and I should mention uh, good friends of the chamber, um, His Excellency Akubad Talabani, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Kurdistan Regional Government, uh, Kubat, of course, a former representative here in Washington, D.C., uh, so no stranger to the United States, and we uh, look forward to hearing from you, uh, Kubad, and of course, uh, Joey Hood, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in the Bureau of Police at the State Department. Um, Joey, I remember it wasn't too long ago, I think December of 2018, when you were Deputy Chief of Mission uh, there at the Embassy in Baghdad. We were uh, with you for a multi-day conference in person, so now we're going virtual. Uh, but we're really delighted to have you with us. Uh, so two people with a lot of uh, substance and understanding of this relationship. And to get the conversation started, um, I thought I'd keep it kind of at a very macro level um, and just ask each of you if, if you could kind of share from your perspectives, what are some of the key challenges uh, to be addressed that would uh, be important to driving economic growth? And uh, Kubat, if, if we can go to you first, uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, and then uh, Joey will follow on uh, to you next. Kubat? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on uh, online with you guys. It would have been nicer to be with you all in, in person, but we have to adapt to the times and to the challenges. And, and the fact that we're having this conference, albeit virtually, is a sign that we are, we're able to, to, to adapt. Um, you know, enabling the drivers of economic growth, I think the, the first thing we have to do and the biggest challenge we face right now and I would say for, for the last seven or eight years is to is to really create an authorizing environment um, that that enables the the economic growth. It's one thing to have a vision and to have a policy to say yes, we're going to diversify it from oil. We're going to focus on agriculture, industry, tourism. The the key elements that that we look to, the key sectors that we look to that that we think can generate um, greater economic growth for, for Iraq and, and for Kurdistan. But we also have to have that authorizing environment that, that enables that growth, to create that environment that enables that investment, that encourages that investment, that encourages uh, competition, that encourages um, foreign investment, that encourages local, local investment. So I think hand in hand with having the vision of, of where you want to go, we also need to have um, the tools at our disposal to to actually get there, and that's I think that is probably I would say the biggest challenge um, we have in in creating that that authorizing environment that that enables economic growth and and diversification. That's very interesting, Kubat, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's one thing to have a vision, but you have to be able to implement a vision and sustain that. So you have to have uh, those mechanisms and processes in place. You're absolutely right. Uh, Joey, we'll come to you with that same question. What would you think uh, would be some of those kind of overriding challenges uh, to uh, impeding economic growth? Well, Steve, if I look at you funny, I may ask you to put your uh, comments in the chat box because uh, uh, I can see everyone very clearly, but the voice comes over um, a little bit fuzzy sometimes. Um, uh, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, and if that's the case, let me wish uh, a good afternoon to Kakubad, uh, dear and good friend. It's great to see you again. And thank you, Steve, for organizing this thing. Uh, you are as intrepid as we've always known you to be. Uh, and so the pandemic is not going to keep you down. Uh, I appreciate the chance to uh, meet with everyone virtually, but uh, there's no substitute to meeting in person uh, as we did 
as you said, back in December of 2018 uh, in Baghdad. Certainly the food is much better uh, when you're in person in Iraq uh, rather than sitting here in a lonely office in Washington. But um, be that as it may, we can have some optimism. You know, there are vaccines on the way. Uh, it'll be a challenge to uh, deliver them to uh, as many people as we need to. But I have full confidence that next, this time next year, uh, we will be sitting somewhere in the Iraqi Kurdistan region and talking about uh, what needs to be done next. And we will do that. Um, you know, people are wondering about our, uh, the U.S. government's level of engagement. What will it be? Uh, what, what is the future going to hold? Uh, I can assure you that we are going to remain engaged, including with the uh, Iraqi Kurdistan region. Um, and partly because of, this, uh, of the great uh, commercial um, opportunities that are there. Uh, there are a number of challenges that go beyond the pandemic. Uh, and as I said, I'm optimistic that those will be met uh, sometime in the next year or so. But there's also security. Uh, we appreciate the great cooperation that we've received for many years from the Kurdistan regional government uh, on that front. And we believe that the region, because of that, is more secure than virtually any other region in the country. And so we want businesses to look very seriously at that. And second, uh, there's an openness and willingness to work with the private sector in the uh, Kurdistan region that you might not see in other regions of Iraq. And so, yes, you know, while Iraq may have a lot of challenges, um, even more than your average country, uh, you know, we urge people to look at the Kurdistan region uh, as a uh, region that is uh, succeeding and doing well, especially in regard to security and uh, with its um, uh, promoting of the of the private sector. And those things we uh, should uh, make us uh, even more optimistic. Joey, I think uh, you, you hit hit on something there that was really important and uh, a few things, but I, I would call attention to the point on, on the embracing of the private sector. And you're, you're absolutely true. That's not always the case. Uh, so we, we appreciate the willingness and eagerness to reach out to entrepreneurs, uh, startups, as well as multinationals uh, across the board. Um, let me come to uh, you've invoked to COVID. And of course, it's absolutely something that's, uh, that's had a, a huge human toll and, and caused a lot of suffering. Um, I would wonder, looking at COVID-19, of course, it's impacting all aspects of our lives. And we, and again, that, that human toll has been, has been unimaginable around the globe. But there have been some break spots in a sense that there's a few trends that it's accelerated um, out of the pandemic. And would be curious, um, coming back to you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, what are or one or two of those lessons learned or trends that we should look to embrace going forward that would perhaps help drive economic growth? Um, in the Kurdistan region and beyond? Um, well, I think the, the flexibility of, of the business community, the flexibility of, of the entrepreneurs and, and actually the, the, the need to accelerate uh, more entrepreneurship in, in Kurdistan, uh, we saw this happen during the, the COVID crisis when we were issuing our lockdowns uh, obviously, restaurants, they had an option to either close or, or adapt. Uh, many chose to adapt how, by having food delivery services. Same for pharmacies, same for grocery stores. Um, life couldn't stop because, because of COVID. And, and even though it did take uh, the, the pandemic, has taken an enormous toll, not just a, a human toll, but a massive economic toll because our trade with our borders, with our countries have, have stopped. Um, oil prices, we know what, what has happened to oil prices around the world. But the economy didn't come to a complete stop because there were these um, little startups, entrepreneurs, and again, just the adaptability and, and the flexibility of, of the business community to, to really absorb the shock, um, but also kind of live with it and, and, and manage it. So I think this is... This is a, an example where if the government was in charge of everything and we decided everything, 
we wouldn't have probably had that mindset to encourage this kind of entrepreneurship. But if you have faith in the private sector, which I like to think we do, um, then you kind of create the, this space for the private sector to, to fill the voids that may uh, be created either as a result of government policy or uh, as a result of, of, of an incident or a shock that is outside of our control, as, as was in the case of, of COVID. So, yes, I, I like, like my good friend Joey, I'm, I'm also optimistic because it's in times of crisis that you get to see not only the resilience of, of your government and, the, and of your employees, but actually the resilience of, of, your, of your society, of your, of your population. And, and you know, we, we are resilient people. We've been through a lot and we're going through a lot right now, but it hasn't led to uh, a complete standstill, certainly on, on, on the economy. It is interesting to think about the resiliency, uh, not only in COVID, but uh, historically uh, in the Kurdistan region and, and in Iraq. And Kuba, I think you hit on something really, really interesting, and that is some of the dynamic and creative relationships and, and new types of businesses and those that have pivoted uh, to adapt. And, and, and you see that kind of creativity in the private sector. Um, Joey, would come to you with the same question. Um, obviously, COVID's touched uh, all of our lives in so many different ways, but there have been some, some positive trends that have come out of it and would welcome your thoughts on uh, what we should look to embrace and kind of push going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, Steve, one of the things that the uh, pandemic has pointed out is the importance of a uh, unfettered free press. Uh, we know how important this is. It, it features uh, prominently in our own constitution in the United States. But what uh, people tuning into this might not be thinking about is the fact that a free press is also very important to a, um, uh, a successful private sector because the free press helps root out uh, allegations of corruption, um, inefficiencies in the market as well. Uh, they keep uh, pricing information um, free and fair uh, to all. So uh, I think that one of the things that we've seen during the pandemic is also the importance of getting out information about how to protect yourself and how to uh, protect your employees and uh, you know how the government is responding, especially on the most local levels, which we see here in the United States is really where the response to the pandemic is taking place. The federal government can do a lot in terms of um, uh, pushing financial relief and support to uh, scientific research. But how a community organizes itself to protect itself from the pandemic is really taking place at a local level. And that's why you need uh, a uh, unfettered free press uh, from that local level all the way up to the uh, regional and federal levels um, to uh, keep government officials uh, on their toes and also keep the public well informed. And uh, that goes for uh, investors and uh, other actors in the private sector as well. Joy, that, that is very, that is very uh, interesting because obviously uh, information is key and uh, I, I never really had thought about the, uh, the way that brings the private sector to the table. Uh, very interesting thoughts. Um, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, um, obviously we, we know, you know, in the private sector, there's no silver bullets in government. Um, but would, would welcome your thoughts, you know, given the, the topic of this discussion, you know, if there is one or two reforms that you could wave that magic wand and have in place tomorrow, you know, to kind of unleash the private sector um, or things that you think that we need to, to work on together, um, what, would that, what would that one or two thing, you know, be that you point us to? Um, you know, being in Kurdistan for the last eight years now, I've, I've, I no longer believe in magic wands. Um, so I, <laughs> I've been looking for one for a long time and there, there isn't any, and, um, Harry Potter did not turn out to be, uh, true. So we are living without the magic wands. So we're, we are actually placing our, our efforts on on reforms that are attainable and, and, and doable. And many of those are related to how the government interacts with its citizens, as well as how we, we promote uh, the, the private sector development. So yep, uh, you heard the prime minister talk about diversification of our economy. Um, that, you know, that is a, a, a target. It's a, it's a policy uh, of our government. 
and we have to do this in this COVID climate. So we were looking at, okay, so how do we make our government first and foremost more efficient? Um, we have a big government, it's a cumbersome government, and, and there's a lot of routine and a lot of bureaucracy currently in, in, our, in our existing system. Um, and so we're now, we're tackling that head on. We, we have, a, we have a, a services program that, that we are implementing um, aggressively, which is aimed at, at cutting the bureaucracy uh, at every transaction that exists between the government and, and the citizens. So we've, we've process mapped about 407 individual services and we've asked every ministry who's in charge of delivering these services to make these services uh, delivered faster, easier uh, and cheaper. Uh, and that, that I think is something that is very tangible and, and the citizens will, will feel this immediately. Uh, one of the key services that we are uh, reforming and restructuring is the how long it takes to set up a company. Now, uh, the current process is cumbersome. It's, it involves many different agencies and many different entities and, and any one of the various entities involved in the process could slow down the process by uh, days, if, if not weeks. So we are, we've set a target. We want to be able to set up a company within 24 hours. Uh, we feel that it's, it's doable. Uh, we've got great support from, from the, the United States, from USAID, uh, the DIA, um, DAI, sorry, uh, to 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 act to implement in, implement this program. So part of this involves uh, process re-engineering uh, of the existing manual process. Uh, once we've restructured the manual processes and and the steps it takes to to get something done, uh, it's when we're going to start digitizing these processes. And and again, when we looking at the digital transformation of our government. This opens up a whole world for a potential industry in Kurdistan, you know, which is the IT industry, which as we as the government begin to digitize, the private sector that interacts with us will need to digitize as well. So I can imagine uh, if you're a tech startup company in Kurdistan, you're very excited right now because the, the opportunities for, for growth are, are really um, plentiful there. Once that, you know, once people start to see that there is progress, and once the government starts to see, and I'm talking about the government bureaucrats and the government employees, once they start to see that these reforms are speeding things up, uh, energizing the economy, uh, leading to more growth, leading to more businesses, which leading to more products, which leading to uh, less reliance on external goods, I think the culture that needs to change, I mean, the culture within government needs to change. That, that needs to be even more supportive to, to the private sector. And I think this is one area where, you know, I think it, it is very difficult given Iraq's history and obviously our history within Iraq, um, you know, this, this notion that the government doesn't always know best. The government isn't the vehicle that should always be the one doing everything. Now, there are many in key positions in our government that believe in the private sector, but we need to see, and this is what we're working on, uh, driving this mentality down through the bureaucracy to make sure that, that our government, our system, our directorates, our sub-directorates, whether they're at the, the capital level or the provincial level or the district or even sub-district level, are there to expedite. You know, use laws and regulations to expedite processes, not using laws and regulations to complicate processes. So this is, um, you know, uh, if we had the magic wand, this is what I'd wave it towards but we don't have the magic wand but we're still working towards it Kuba that, that's absolutely fascinating and in uh, in in the spirit of free press we'll fact check and there is no magic wand so um, we we with that but we we really do appreciate um, you, you've always been a champion uh, of a service oriented government and e-government and and digitizing services has always been something I know you've been a big proponent of to empower the private sector. Um, and we just know that we greatly appreciate that and, and all of that effort. And as you mentioned, it really is a, a cultural, it's a mindset change. It's an evolution that is taking place. And, and we really appreciate all the effort that you're putting behind that to drive that. Um, Joey, coming to you with a, with a similar question, uh, we'll set aside no magic wands, uh, but if there is, uh, you know, a reform or two that you would encourage us to focus on, well, and Steve, work you're on going to accuse me of team. having uh, pre-cooked this answer with uh, Kak Kubad. Uh, the reality is, I didn't. But I'm going to just echo what he said because uh, we, in fact, 
have been working with him personally for uh, several years to help turn the government, the regional government from a regulatory environment to an enabling environment. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example from outside the Kurdistan region, from uh, the government in Baghdad. You know, we face all of these problems with our uh, humanitarian assistance implementers having to get uh, letters to move from one city to another, or even just um, a few hundred meters down a road sometimes, they need a letter from this one, a letter from that one. And uh, so we've been pressing the government on trying to reform that. And they say, well, you know, we can reduce the number of letters or the, or the number of, uh, or, or we can increase the number of days that a letter is valid. And finally, we just threw up our hands and said, why do you need a letter at all? You know, if these organizations are registered in the country, the people employed in them are either Iraqi or they're foreigners who have valid visas. Why do you need letters in the first place? So it's that sort of uh, stepping back and looking at the entire process that we're helping the Kurdistan regional government do. And we'd like to help the government in Baghdad do as well to ask ourselves, why do we even need this process? If there's 407 processes or steps in the process, you know, we need to ask ourselves, what the purpose is of each one of those and then turn it as best we can from a regulatory environment to more of an, a private sector enabling environment. Uh, and as long as you protect health and safety, the rest of it uh, should be able to flow uh, much more easily. So magic wand, that's what it would be. Remove, you know, 405 of the 407 steps and, um, you know, take care of health and safety and otherwise, just let the private sector take off, and um, and and that will bring a lot more economic health to the region. Well, that's music to our ears, uh, Joey. We we couldn't agree more. Um, I want to give you each an opportunity for any any final last messages for our viewers before we uh, close out this session. Uh, Kubad, we'll come to you first. Well, Joey, let's go to let's go ahead and I go to you. Kubad maybe hit the wrong button, uh, but uh, anyhow, <laughs> I uh, I would just leave everyone with um, a final thought of optimism. Uh, the vaccines are coming. Uh, the results are very positive. Uh, I think that um, sooner rather than later, the pandemic will be behind us, and our challenge is going to be uh, figuring out ways to keep all that was good, all that resiliency and creativity that came out of the pandemic and using it uh, to go forward to find new and interesting um, investment projects and uh, other activities. But through it all, the United States government will remain engaged with the Kurdistan region and the government in Baghdad uh, to um, you know, help with reform and to help create the enabling environment that we all know is needed uh, to uh, bring economic growth to Iraq. Well, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Joey Hood, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Talabani, thank you both so very much for your insights uh, this morning, this afternoon. Uh, there's really a lot for us to work together to take forward, and we look forward to working with you both as we go into 2021. I hope to see you both soon in person, and, and Joey, as you said, hopefully we can uh, get out uh, to Iraq, uh, to the Kurdistan region, and, and break bread and enjoy some of that wonderful food. Thank so you, th Steve. Uh, very much. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Well, next, we're absolutely delighted to be hearing uh, from what is, in essence, the economic team of the Kurdistan Regional Government, a ministerial panel uh, entitled Economic Priorities for 2021 and Beyond. Uh, it'll feature uh, His Excellency Awad Nouri, Minister of Finance and Economy, uh, His Excellency Dara Rashid Mahmoud, Minister of Planning, and His Excellency Mohammed Shukri, Chairman of the Kurdistan Board of Investment. And the session will be moderated by Dwalar al -Adin, President of the Middle East Research Institute. So join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. 
Welcome to today's session on investment. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, especially Mr. Steve Lutz, and the Kurdistan Regional Government Representation Team in the United States. Thanks to the speakers on this panel. His Excellency Awad Sheikh Janab, Minister of Finance. His Excellency Dara Rashid, Minister of Planning. And His Excellency Mohammed Chukri, Chairman of Investment Board of the Kurdistan Region. On your behalf, I have thanked the organizers and I would like to thank you for your participation as well. I will start with today's panel discussion. This event has been specially arranged for investing companies, local and international, particularly American investors who would like to know more about us and invest in the Kurdistan region. This event is being broadcast live so local businesses and the people of Kurdistan are watching and would also need to know about the investment policies of the Kurdistan region and benefit from today's discussion. They are more interested than anyone else in today's topic. So friends, we have to pinpoint all the factors that attract local and international investors, how to overcome the impediments and face them and speak very frankly about the challenges and solutions because investors, whether they are local or foreign, before they bring their own assets and capital to Kurdistan region, they have made their own in-depth analysis and carried out studies about the Kurdistan region. They know about the risks and they know about what is going on in Kurdistan. So we are not here today to educate them about the basics, since they are very intelligently looking at the subject before making any decisions about investing. We have to speak very frankly and transparently, but at the same time to reassure them that our long-term future is to rebuild this region, and that we have big ambitions. Attracting investors is one of the main policies to participate in rebuilding the infrastructure and investment of this region. We hope those that invest in Kurdistan region will never look back. First, I will start with Minister Dara. Your Excellency, as the Minister of Planning, we can say that your ministry could represent all the other departments and ministries. All ministers who are participating in today's panel are members of the Kurdistan Region High Committee for the Economy and are familiar with the strategic plans and policies of the Kurdistan Regional Government. Before we delve into how to provide a suitable environment for investment, I would like to ask Kagdara, speaking for the others as well, to give us a snapshot of the Kurdistan Regional Government's policy. Because when this government was sworn in and established, a number of steps were taken on diversifying the economic resources of Kurdistan region for investment in different sectors and to enrich Kurdistan region's economy. A year and a half has passed since the Kurdistan region's reform program was announced. We want to know where we are in terms of planning and implementation of this reform plan so that investors have a better understanding. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. With the permission of His Excellency, the Minister of Finance, because our work complements each other. As you know, after the announcement, the agenda of KRG's ninth cabinet, the Kurdistan regional government proactively works to implement economic reforms. But unfortunately, the financial crisis around the globe and in Kurdistan region, due to the outbreak of coronavirus, the government had to implement those plans more rapidly and actively work towards reform. We came to an understanding on the necessity of having a diversified economy and providing better public services. As I said before, the Kurdistan regional government from the start made the decision that the Kurdistan region needs economic reforms. 
And as you know, the global financial crisis and the outbreak of coronavirus caused the countries around the world to face an enormous crisis, with the world moving towards a recession. Economic reforms became necessary and the Kurdistan regional government recognizes that reform is very essential. I will set out our economic reforms in a few brief points. I can say that our Ministry of Planning, in coordination with other ministries, including Ministry of Finance, was asked to prepare a draft for economic reforms. I can share with you the main points of the final draft of the economic reforms. The first point being the balancing of the finances and reforming the financial system, which I am sure His Excellency, the Minister of Finance, will shed a light on this point later. We have already started working on this point by reducing operational expenditure and increasing revenues. In the first six months, we were able to double our domestic revenues. We have also made reforms in the custom and tax system and reformed financial management, which the Minister of Finance can talk about in detail. Also, the Kurdistan regional government believes that the diversification of the economy and revenue is essential because Kurdistan in particular and Iraq in general rely on oil for their income. As you know, due to the recent upheavals, the price of oil dramatically decreased, which led us to a crisis. The diversification of the economy is on the cabinet's agenda, along with the plans to develop agriculture and industrial zones. With the permission, Kagdara, we all agree that many countries around the world, even the United States, have faced these crises. Please tell us about the implementation of those policies and pledges that have been implemented by the Kurdistan regional government in the past 15 months and what changes should we expect in different sectors of the economy. As I said, we have reduced our operational expenditure, our domestic revenues have increased and we have made reforms in the tax system. We haven't raised taxes, but just by restructuring the tax system, we have been able to increase tax revenue, which His Excellency the Minister of Finance can talk about later. My apologies, Kagdara, these are all financial reforms and revenue. I want you to speak about other sectors of the economy. When I spoke about the diversification of economy, I would like you to give information to foreign investors about the sectors which the government is trying to attract investors to, whether it's agriculture or industry, especially the sectors that Minister Awad will not talk about. The subject of agriculture and domestic production is very important. In the last visit of His Excellency, the Prime Minister of the KRG to Europe, the Chairman of the Investment Board and I were part of the delegation. The visit was mainly about agriculture. The development of agriculture and domestic production is one of the KRG's priorities and the establishment of industrial zones, which I am sure the Chairman of the Investment Board will speak about. We want to make changes and utilize other resources and not just rely on oil. For example, agriculture, manufacturing, and giving precedence to tourism through tourism board. The priorities of the government are these three foundational sectors. As for the banking sector, to attract foreign investors, you need an advanced modern banking system. If there isn't an advanced banking system, investment will not be successful in any country. His Excellency, the Minister of Finance, will no doubt talk about the banking sector, the establishment of a national bank, as well as the revision of laws and regulations that deal with the private sector. As you know, before investors faced too much red tape and they were not able to invest easily. You spoke about a one-stop shop. I would like the Chairman of the Investment Board to speak about this. Apologies, Kagdara. I will come back to you. I know you have many important points to make. 
We are at the beginning of our session and only speaking within a general framework. I wanted you to provide this general information to pave the way for Minister Awad to then speak about the details. Minister Awad, you are the Minister of Finance and you have a lot more experience than us. You know better than us what the problems are and where the solutions lie. I would like you, in your allotted time, to put yourself in the place of an investor. What attracts an American investor to Kurdistan? How do you reassure him? I don't mean yourself, I mean the government or the ministry that you are representing. What has the ministry done to assure investors and attract them to come to Kurdistan? The floor is yours, Your Excellency, as Minister of Finance. Greetings to you all. I would like to briefly speak about what the Ministry of Finance has done in reference to the KRG's reform program. The Ministry of Finance has made the following reforms in the financial and economic sector. The Ministry of Finance and Economy within the KRG's reform program has started its reform plan in the direction of increasing revenues, bringing down operational expenditure, reducing red tape and increasing transparency and digitizing the departments that come under the umbrella of the Ministry of Finance. We have taken all the necessary steps in those areas. In terms of our financial policy, we have worked on restructuring our tax system and customs in order to increase revenues and at the same time support our local production, expand job opportunities and attract more foreign investors in such a way as to participate in supporting production with the aim of increasing our GDP using more local labor and at the same time learning from the knowledge and experience of foreign investors. We want at the same time to reduce taxes and customs fees on our public. I would like to very quickly give you some examples of what we have done at the Ministry of Finance. First, the Ministry of Finance digitized the custom system as per rules and regulations in Iraq in order to be more transparent and reduce red tape. Second, we have digitized the pension system and established the pension fund. This fund could be used in the investment sector in the future. Third, in the tax system, we have taken many necessary steps in order to adapt the principles of fairness. In general, the tax in Iraq has been arranged by law. Many other steps have been taken with regards to the budget and quality assurance. What we have done is all in the interest of investors. Foreign investors, by law, are permitted ownership of land. Our investment laws are the best when compared to the investment laws of other countries in the region. Fourth, we have digitized the government's operational expenditure by using an advanced system to prevent and avoid wasting resources. Kurdistan region has a conducive environment for investment in the fields of agriculture, manufacturing and services. Minister Awad, with your permission, you have talked about the main points. I would like to know how many of those points are wishes, plans and how many have actually been implemented. What you mentioned are the desires of every government. All governments want to have a digitized system. I want to know what stage has been reached since you started working on this. I will give some practical examples. All our custom points have been connected to each other and to the Ministry of Finance through an electronic system. For example, in terms of tax collection, we have changed the system. We have started allowing payment in installments and direct payment. For example, we have put in place new regulations in order to make trade and transit through our border points easier and for everyone to be able to freely carry out their business without obstacles. For foreign investors, tax exemptions have been put in place in a very appropriate way. In terms of ownership for foreign investors, we have provided the opportunity at the Finance Ministry for the registration of land for foreign investors and, of course, Dr. Mohammad Shukri, Chairman of the Investment Board, has many more details on that.
Kagawa, can we say that the government, with its intentions, wishes and aims, is trying to attract foreign investors and ease the way for them according to domestic and international laws and customs and facilitate everything that's necessary, which in the past was talked about? Perhaps Dr. Mohammed Shukri can talk about this. They used to say that Kurdistan's investment law is the most investor-friendly law in the region. So what you are saying is that with every intention, you are ready to remove all the financial obstacles that used to get in the way of investors. Kagawat, I will come back to you to discuss a very important subject. I would like you to answer my question about the banking sector in Kurdistan. We talked a lot about the importance of banking and Kagdara spoke about it too. What has been accomplished? Everyone says that we need to strengthen the banking sector. I want to hear the details. As you know, Kurdistan is not a sovereign state. And even now, there is an issue with the culture of dealing with the banks. People don't understand the important role of the banking sector. Until now, investors have not benefited from the banking system because the banks haven't been able to become the engine for supporting investment. Later, I would like to hear from you regarding what has been done in this important field. But Kag Mohammed, something very important. A giant international investor and a local investor in Kurdistan, when they want to start a project, the first thing they want is a guarantee, like a law that protects them. If you sign a piece of paper with them, they need to be assured that the document remains valid after 15 years or 10 years or 20 years later. It's still valid and not impacted by laws and regulations that change every day or committees is formed every other day to change the laws and regulations. Please tell us about the legal framework so that the foreign and local both can have certainty about the future of their business and confidence about their profits. Greetings to you, Kang Dilawar, and greetings to Minister Awad and Minister Dara and everyone else. The current investment law, which is investment law number four of 2006, has many great benefits for foreign investors. The draft law that we are currently working on will be very helpful. The new investor law has reached the stage of being reviewed by the Council of Ministers. Maybe in the coming weeks it will be presented in a cabinet meeting and then sent to the Kurdistan parliament. The current investment law and the draft investment law provides the foreign investor with the same rights as local investors. In the definition it says that both foreign and local investors, according to the law, are equal, which is a very positive point. We treat the foreign investor like a local one. As the Minister of Finance said, foreign investors can get the ownership of their project and the land can be registered under their name. There are no such legal rights in the region that allow foreign investors to have ownership of the project and the land as well. This is a very good point that has been in the investment law in the past and will remain in the future. Another point is, if the investor wants to sell their project or dismantle the project, the investor can take all their capital back to their home country. Third, the foreign investor also has the right to take all their profits outside the Kurdistan region. In most countries, this has been prohibited to some degree by law, but in Kurdistan region, this opportunity has been given to the investor to take their profits outside of Kurdistan region. A point of strength in the current and the future investment law is that investment projects will never be nationalized. This is fundamental and a legal guarantee. As you said, a legal guarantee is needed. There will be no laws or regulations in the future, whether in 10 or 20 years time, that would impact the nature of investment projects, nor their ownership. In the current investment law, all investors, whether they are foreign or local, have tax exemptions for 10 years and customs exemptions for 5 years. In the current law, we have a paragraph in the extra exemption section. 
if a foreign investor has a joint venture with a local investor, they may be able to get extra exemptions. We had a discussion with Ministry of Finance, which His Excellency Minister Awad is aware of, so that foreign investors will get extra exemptions when they have their own projects in Kurdistan, which is another important point in the interest of foreign investors. This can be worked on in the future. Two questions came to my mind. I would like you to think about them when I come back to you later because I will go back to Kagdara. You have spoken about the partnership between local and foreign investors. Be assured that they speak to each other and know about each other's challenges. Local investors also face many issues such as whether they received their financial entitlements or not, like a change in the tax regulation. They are under scrutiny from the media, from the government, from people. Sometimes local businesses are uncertain about doing projects that are profitable and about reinvesting their profits. They want guarantees from government. They want government to protect them. Foreign investors ask local businesses what to do. But local and foreign investors have the same issues and difficulties. That's why, for this question, I am looking for an answer from all of you. But, Khan Mohammed, I will come back to you later to discuss something very important, which is reducing red tape and bureaucracy. Tell me about one-stop shop or, as you name it, single window service. At the moment, investors want to come with their own capital to do a small project, but they have to visit four or five different ministries for their paperwork to get done. Have you started the single window service? And what stage is it at? I would like to hear your answer later. Kagdara, I'm coming back to you and I don't want to be unfair in terms of time management of the session. Earlier you spoke about many important points. Something which is very significant that your ministry is dealing with a public-private partnership, PPP. This is something that Kurdistan can use to build infrastructure. Please tell us what the government has done in regards to PPP and how is the government facilitating this? One of the main parts of the reform program was public-private partnership, PPP. Earlier, the Kurdistan regional government had two basic papers about the legal framework of public-private partnership. We at the Ministry of Planning in the ninth cabinet, we have prepared a very detailed draft paper that includes the legal framework for PPP from beginning of the process to the end. We were able to prepare regulations for organizing the work of public-private partnerships. As you know, every country that does not have the necessary budget for public projects needs to partner with the private sector. As I said before, we didn't have the proper legal framework whereby the government had the role of supervision and monitoring, and at the same time a framework that protected the private sector. What we did and got approved by the Council of Ministers was a legal framework for partnership between the public and private sectors. This is one of the areas that supports both local and foreign investors not only to invest in private sector projects, but at the same time invest in public projects that are needed by the government. Both the investment law and the laws and regulations that help the investors in the public sector may bring more support to the private sector in public-private partnership projects. Would you be able to share with us some examples of successful partnership projects between the public and private sectors? In many countries, public-private partnership has been very successful. I am speaking about Kurdistan. For example, the main source of electricity production in Kurdistan was hydropower from Dukan and Darbandi Khan, which only provided 10% of electricity to the people of Kurdistan. 
As a result of government's partnership with the private sector, we are able to provide 21 to 22 hours of electricity a day, which may increase in the near future. These power plants have been established by private sector in partnership with the government. By building those large power plants with private sector, we were able to bring electricity production to its current stage. In terms of electricity partnership production contracts in Kurdistan region, we have three contracts in Dohok, four in Erbil, and four in Soleimani. We have seen that electricity has been a good and a successful example. All the examples of PPP, even if they haven't been completed, are there other examples? In the past, we only had contracts in terms of production of electricity. But now the government is working to have contracts for the distribution of electricity and even collecting fees. There were issues with the distribution of electricity and collecting fees. That's why government wants to have contracts for this service as well, so that it can continue to provide this service. In other sectors, after establishing the Department of Public-Private Partnership at the Ministry of Planning, we have received PPP proposals from all sectors. In the field of education, we have more than seven projects to be implemented in Arbil, Dohok, Selebani, Soran, and Zaho. These are joint public and private projects for the school system known as Sabis or Shuefat to have schools in all these cities. The government is supporting projects in all other sectors to provide services to the public and to provide greater job opportunities for our citizens and for university graduates in the Kurdistan region. Thank you very much, Kagdara. If we have time, I would like to come back to you to talk about an important point, which is corruption and transparency, fighting corruption. Kagdara, I want to know about what has been done in terms of banking sector. Sorry, Kagdara, I meant to address this question to Minister Awad. I will come back to you later about fighting corruption and transparency. Minister Awad, the floor is yours. Frankly speaking, the Kurdistan regional government, since its establishment, has paid special attention to the banking sector. In Kurdistan, we have two types of banks government banks and private banks. In our government banks, we have already started to digitize the banking system and have connected the banking network. About 30 to 35 percent of the digitization system has been finished. We have started to acquire know-how from the Iraqi Central Bank and the United Nations in order to further develop this sector. Regarding private banks, I would like to say that about 90 to 95 percent of the issues the private banks had with the government have been solved and the government has paid back its debts. Maybe only a few banks are left, otherwise the issues of most of the banks have already been solved. We wanted private banks and the private sector to work hand in hand in developing Kurdistan. As you know, the partnership between private banks and the private sector is very important. After the establishment of the ninth cabinet, we started to improve our internal revenues and provide funds for strategic projects like the construction of roads. Projects that had been suspended were able to resume, but unfortunately, the project slowed down again due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and the recent political issues between Baghdad and Erbil. I am hoping by the beginning of 2021, all these issues will be solved. 
Thank you very much, Kagawad. I will come back to you later about the same question that I had asked Kagdara about uh, fighting corruption. And maybe I will ask you another question about the financial entitlements of private companies to be paid by the government. If Kag Mohammed has information about this question, I would like to hear his views as well. Kag Mohammed, I would like you to speak to us about the one-stop shop or single window service that aims to reduce red tape. At the beginning of this year, the beginning of 2020, we established a section for the single window service at the Board of Investment after His Excellency, the Prime Minister, reiterated that governments have a one-window approach to dealing with investors in their investment boards and those departments that work with the investment board. This section has already been established. To get an investment license, you need to get approval from about 13 departments and offices. The one window section has representatives from all these 13 departments. At the moment, we are working on providing space for this section inside the investment board building, and in the future, we have plans to establish the same section in all investment board offices in Dohok, Soleimani, Erbil, Germian, Raparin, Halabja, and Zaho. This section needs to be given authority and its members need to have authority to approve investment licenses. On November the 2nd this year, the Economic High Council of Kurdistan established a special group to work on allocating land for Board of Investment projects. This group also has the participation of members of the relevant ministries to work on allocating land for investment projects and to put them on the investment map. We're working on designing a map of investment projects for Kurdistan region, and so the plan will be put on the map. Once these departments and sections are operational, the time frame for projects and paperwork will be significantly reduced. Would you give assurance to investors because you know about their problems and challenges? Yes, for sure. I can give that assurance. I hope that this one window policy also be implemented for regular citizens in districts, sub districts, and villages as well. I would like you also to think about my question on fighting corruption and transparency. Kagdara, I have asked you this question first. I would like to hear your response. I will again come back to the program of KRG's ninth cabinet on transparency and fighting corruption, which was one of the priorities of this cabinet, including the government reform law. Maybe people have not yet seen the outcome of the content of the reform law, but in the near future, they will see all the outcomes in dealing with many issues related to corruption and lack of transparency, like employing and giving a special rank to government employees without merit. People will see the results. Regarding transparency and fighting corruption, we at the Ministry of Planning have digitized the awarding of contracts, which was one of the issues that people talked about with suspicion and concern. We have digitized everything, including the regulations. Starting from next month, all the process of tendering and awarding contracts will go through an electronic system, which should reassure people that there won't be any room for corruption. Another area of reform is biometrics. In the last few days, His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister announced that in the first round of carrying out checks on government employees, 16,500 ghost employees were discovered. The reforms also continue within the Peshmerga military forces. It's very clear that fighting corruption and increasing transparency is our priority, but as you know, corruption will not be eradicated in one or two days. It takes time and people will see the results clearly in the future. Well done, thank you. 
When a foreign investor is uh, protected by the law of its own country or that of host country or by the contracts have been signed, they do not fear corruption. Sorry, the network has been disrupted. So, Kagawa. What steps has the Ministry of Finance taken in terms of fighting corruption, improving transparency, and institutionalization? Sorry, Minister, we can't hear you. Thank Muhammad, if you're hearing me, we would like to hear your response. For sure, the main point for fighting corruption and increasing transparency at the Board of Investment can be seen through the announcement of our strategic plan and the establishment of the boards that I spoke about earlier. I'm able to confidently say that if there was corruption within our board and its units, I can say that now it's close to zero. I can say that in the near future, the board of investment will be free from corruption because there has been close follow-up and monitoring of the areas that were seen as a source of corruption. One of the sources of corruption is red tape and a slow bureaucracy. We have tried our best to remove that. Transparency is also very important. We have our website and are now working with the government in order to publish all the relevant data on the website of the Board of Investment. All the information will be available for the public in terms of granting licenses for investment projects and welcoming investors. A zero number for corruption is good news, but needs transparency and evidence in order for the public to have trust. Yes. Minister Awad, let's see if we can hear you. Dear Dr. Dlauer, with your permission, I will just take one minute of your time. You can speak in place of Kagawa as we are nearing the end of the discussion. One point that we have forgotten to talk about is the electronic registration of companies. The registration of companies was one of the main problems because it was done through a very complicated system. Maybe just registering the name of a company could take a few months despite paying the fee. Now, the Kurdistan regional government has decided to digitize the registration process of companies and, like other developed countries, for it to be completed in a couple of days and to be done online without the need to visit government and non-governmental offices. Last point, please. The final point, the Minister of Finance, the Chairman of Investment Board, and I are members of the Kurdistan Regional Government High Council for Investment, which is chaired by His Excellency Prime Minister and includes His Excellency the Deputy Prime Minister. We would like to assure all investors, including those from America and all of Europe, that we will facilitate all that is necessary for them to invest in Kurdistan and for the process to be as easy as in investing in their own countries. As the chairman of the Board of Investment said, we will do everything to ease the way for investors and will continue to provide very favorable investment environment, especially compared to the neighboring countries and the region. I want to assure them on behalf of the KRG that investors in Kurdistan are in a secure environment and KRG will do everything to support them. Thank you very much. I hope the same assurances will be given to the local investors. Kagdara, Kagawa, Kag Muhammad, thank you very much for taking part. I would like to thank the organizers for this conference.
Can everybody hear me? I'm, I think I'm not seeing uh, Russell. Shake Boz, do you, do you hear me? Yes, Matt. Great. Why don't we give it a second here and we'll wait and see if we can, uh, if, uh, if Russell's gonna join us. Yes, maybe he's coming. Okay, um, I think we're gonna just go ahead and get started. It, it is a pleasure to participate in today's event and discuss with industry leaders the future of the US-Iraq Energy Partnership. And my, my thanks first go to the US Chamber for hosting this critical event. Uh, just yesterday, the, the U.S. Department of Energy Deputy Secretary Menzies was happy to provide uh, opening remarks during yesterday's forum and during which he re reiterated our policy for our energy partnership with the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And just last week, many of us participated in the Kurdistan Iraq Economic Forum, which focused on the region's economic diversification vision. In my remarks, I noted that these diversification goals were critical and not mutually exclusive from the Kurdistan region's energy sector. And that is because in our view, the KRG's energy sector and the development of its energy resources will be the backbone of its economy and will be critical to fully envision an economically diverse economy and one that is that, that postures the region for a prosperous economic future. And towards this end, uh, the United States values its strong economic energy relationship with Kurdistan and fellow Iraq for several reasons. Uh, first, we believe in the Iraqi constitution and the place that the Kurdistan regional government uh, plays in that constitution. Uh, second, the KRG energy sector uh, we view is key to its economic prosperity that will enable the, its diversification goals. And third, the KRG energy sector will make it an indispensable partner to both Baghdad and as a regional energy provider. So today, it's my pleasure to host a distinguished panel of industry leaders to discuss the energy sector in Kurdistan. And we are honored to be joined by uh, Baz Karim, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Car Group, and Chris Bowers, uh, Senior Advisor at Chevron. And so, Sheikh Baz, if I could start with you, and, and you were on the ground there in Kurdistan, could you could you start us off and give us a feel for the current situation, the challenges and the opportunities in the energy space? Okay, dear Matt, thank you. And pleasure to be here today with all of you. Times have been difficult with the pandemic and oil price, but add politics to it, a bit to it also. But what we see is that Kurdistan remained resilient. We also remained resilient as two governments transition in Baghdad and Arbil, and relation remained open. In Kurdistan, we are producing around 450,000 barrels of oil per day. My company is more than third of that. Gas production is up from 350 million cubic feet gas to the 550 million cubic feet gas, with the car being 25% of that. And the delivery of power in Kurdistan is at record levels. We continue to produce power in Kurdistan for the rest of Iraq, and we continue to refine oil and deliver refined products to the rest of Iraq. This cooperation is stable, but it unfortunately missed additional opportunities. We have access capacity in power and refining, and Iraq has demand for the electricity and fuels. This is an area we hope to see good progress and cooperation in the near future. Our banking, our banking system is not tooled to handle our needs. The U.S. supports companies in Kurdistan in their energy projects. We know that you are looking at a few other things as well. To, to uh, unlock the potential, we need this type of support. Our cautious optimism will soon result in new investment from our side as well. We will convert our power plant to combined cycle. We will increase gas recovery and production. We are looking at gas related infrastructure and gas to industrial projects. Matt, I am happy to answer any question you have. 
Thank you. Sheikh Baz, thank you for that. Um, if we could, if I could follow up quickly with you, uh, can you speak to the future uh, gas relationship with Kurdistan and fellow Iraq? What what could that look like going forward? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned the electricity, uh, excess electricity, but but more broadly, both that there and for natural gas. We see the uh, uh, first step uh, to uh, have gas to power in Kurdistan because we have uh, 6,500 megawatts capacity and we are producing now over 3,500. Then we have capacity of 3,000 megawatt to send it to the rest of Iraq. Uh, when, we when we increase the capacity of the gas, for sure, we go to the uh, power generation, then we send power to the rest of Iraq. This is our uh, first stage, I think. When we have excess gas more than the capacity of uh, adding value to change it to the power, uh, then we try to uh, find another market to, to the rest of Iraq or to the export. Okay, Sheikh Fahd, thank you. And I think we'll come back to you because I think that's a critical point for us all to, uh, to talk about here today. And uh, first, before we go on, I'd like to also introduce uh, Russell Freeman, the Chief Executive Officer from Hillwood Energy. And Russell, if I could uh, put you on the spot and turn directly to you, can you briefly describe for us your history of working in the Kurdistan region? Absolutely. And let me first apologize for being tardy. I would like to blame that on your technical team, but this was user error. And so I am, I'm sorry to join the party late, but I appreciate being here. Um, our first trip, uh, to Kurdistan was in 2006. And in fact, our team met Sheikh Baz, uh, one of our fellow panelists here on that trip. Uh, we ended up signing a production sharing contract in 2007 for the Sarsang block. And uh, we had our first major discovery in 2011 uh, on a structure called Swartika. Uh, we began selling oil uh, in 2013 from uh, based on or from that structure. And then we had another significant discovery in 2014. Uh, today, we are partners with or co-venturers with Total. Uh, we're the operator. We have a 77.5% uh, operator or working interest. Total has the remainder with the Kurdistan government having a 20% carried interest. Um, we have 380 million barrels of 2P reserves. We're producing 32,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of our team and the impact that we've had on Kurdistan. As Ross said yesterday in his introductory <laughs> comments, we have invested over $1.6 billion and created 2,100 local jobs. Um, we also have had an economic impact, if you include the government's portion of oil, of uh, over 3 billion, uh, 3 billion barrels. And we are currently ramping up our production. We're building a 25,000 barrel facility right now and uh, preparing to drill four wells to fill it. And so our, our total production will end up being 55,000 barrels. Uh, we're really pleased uh, that we have the support of the U.S. government. We earlier this year closed a loan with the U.S. Development Finance Corp. And uh, that is helping us fund this expansion. It's, uh, we were the, the first uh, operation in Kurdistan that the U.S. government um, supported in terms of uh, lending. And so we're thrilled to be there. Uh, we're, we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about all of this. Thanks, Matt. Ru Russell, thank you for that. And um, so could you then could you could you then add to that and describe for us some of the challenges and also some of the opportunities that, that you all foresee in the energy sector in Kurdistan? Well, we've, <laughs> we've faced a lot of challenges uh, through the years, uh, you know, going back to Maliki cutting off the Kurds from a budget perspective, um, you know, the, uh, the post uh, effects of the referendum, uh, COVID, uh, airports being shut down, et cetera. But through that, you know, the people there have been uh, phenomenal to work with. Uh, in general, we feel like we have the support of uh, most of the government. And so the opportunities are, are, we believe the opportunities are vast for people to come in. There are opportunities to continue development. There's opportunities for explore, further exploration. Um, 
you know, there are opportunities. You talked about uh, electricity. There's opportunities for gas, uh, you know, uh, gas infrastructure. Uh, much of the gas in the associated fields and gas fields is sour. And so there's a need for U.S. companies to come in and, um, you know, uh, maybe have a, a U.S. EPC contractor that could come in and and help the Kurds with uh, with gas. There's there's many opportunities. You know, the, the biggest thing I think that we need right now is we need a, a, an agreement on the budget between Baghdad and Kurdistan, something that's rational and reasonable. Uh, and lives up to the spirit of the Iraqi constitution that recognizes uh, that Kurdistan has a right um, to produce this oil. And, you know, some arrangement that that moved in that direction would allow the Kurds to be able to plan their budget. It would, it would allow the, the uh, KRG to uh, help set up financing for their debt. It would add legitimacy to, uh, to the PSCs and uh, hopefully it would put us on a path to where the IOCs could eventually market their own oil. Uh, so there's there's opportunities, there have been challenges, but um, the biggest thing right now is to have some agreement between Baghdad and Erbil. No, that's helpful because I think we all appreciate the dynamic relationship uh, between Baghdad and Erbil and the role that energy plays uh, in that relationship. And, and maybe we can come back to talking about gas, uh, but but first let's let's turn to Chris. Um, and Chris, could you please share with us uh, what is Chevron's experience in the, in the Kurdistan region, and, and what does the future hold in your mind? Well, thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for the intrusion of an English accent into this uh, into this American show. Uh, but it's a great organizer. It's a, it's a great event, and 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 I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'll sort of focus my remarks briefly around sort of three three concepts or three ideas really. One, welcome, two, partnership, and and, and three, resilience. I think when we first came into into the country, into Kurdistan in, in 2012, uh, you know, and we went up to, to see the president and the prime minister and what have you, uh, we got a sense of welcome and that was that was wonderful. But what was really striking for us, I think, was that was that that same language of welcome. We heard in the we heard in the villages. We heard it in the ministries. Uh, we heard it right the way through uh, Kurdish society, actually, um, and it was very encouraging. and And I think after a while, once a message has been, been repeated so often, you think, actually, this is sincere. People really mean it. Um, and the message was very clear as well. Look, we understand you 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 you're here to make money. We understand you have you you're bringing in experts. Please employ some local people as well, and and we we, we like to think that we we we've done that. Uh, I'll come on to why uh, later. Um, that's also a, a critical thing for for Chevron operating anywhere around the world is that is is a sense of partnership. Um, now you know that doesn't always mean that you agree with everybody because if you're agreeing with your partners all the time, then it it doesn't tend to be sufficiently sufficiently dynamic. Um, and it's also about what, not what, sort of what you do, but also how you do it. Um, and we found very effective partners in the in the ministry, uh, in, uh, in the MNR, uh, with our new partnership with 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 Ganel, uh, which will go forward in terms of, of of how we manage the operations, which I think is is a great deal for Kurdistan. It's a great deal for us, and and, and it's pretty good for Ganel as well. Um, and they'll also have that very strong partnership with the communities because, you know, of course, we're, we're, we're operating in, 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 in their areas. So, of course, you have to establish those, those good partnerships and, and, and good relationships. And I think we've been, um, been lucky enough to do that. Um, a slightly odd place to talk about staff and recruitment, but, but I think uh, uh, under this partnership idea, uh, we found excellent local staff, um, high quality loyal, quick to learn, uh, and we've, we've been really encouraged by that, and, and, and that has helped in, in how we've been able to employ more people, uh, more Kurds, uh, more Kurdistanis. And then we, we come back to this, this theme resilience. I, I, 
I know lots of people have used it already, so I was tempted to sort of look up my thesaurus and try and find a, uh, a synonym, I, I don't know, adaptability, perspective, or what have you. But I think anyone who 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 goes to Kurdistan, who works there, who who does who operates there, approaches, if they're wise, with a sense of humility. Um, not only in what the people have been through, which is extraordinary, and you know predates ISIS and and goes back to 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 the Saddam era and those decades where where being Kurdish was 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 a pretty tough thing to be, um, and I think that sense of of understanding where we are and understanding uh, to to whatever we, extent we can the people um, has helped us appreciate the tremendous resilience that that is in the that is in the area um, and that sense that you know there is a perspective that you you can get through things you can be adaptable um, you can hunker down when you need to uh, and you can you can you can push on through the uh, through the good times thanks for that Chris and um, and, and it's a and it's a and it's a perspective that I think we can all appreciate uh, having having all of us uh, been to Kurdistan many times um, Sheikh Baz, if I can come back to you and ask, uh, we, we're in this COVID pipe pandemic and, and obviously the effects uh, of the pandemic have had real and tangible impacts on many, many people to include uh, the energy sector and, and, and many countries, the United States notwithstanding. Um, and there's also been some huge human casualties. And so I, I'm, I'm remiss not to note uh, our, our condolences uh, to the passing of the Erbil governor, uh, uh, Farsat Sophie and our condolences to his family um, and, and the impacts are real at a human at a, at a human uh, scale as well. When we look at Kurdistan uh, post COVID-19, what, what do you see uh, the energy sector in Kurdistan looking like if, 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 if it was a perfect world? What would the natural gas market look like in Kurdistan at 10 years from now or five years from now following this pandemic? Yeah. If we look to the energy, uh, we look to the uh, oil and gas uh, both. In the uh, oil side, uh, you saw with the pandemic, uh, the turbulence uh, on the price. And, you know, uh, this uh, have an impact on the investment and development more in the uh, oil side. With the uh, after pandemic, we expect that we see a more stable market for the oil then uh, we see more investment and developing more capacity uh, in the reservoir available in Kurdistan. On the gas side, uh, you know, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, we are in the first stage of uh, boosting the industry uh, in the gas side to have more uh, gas for the infrastructure, for the power, uh, and uh, for sharing power with the rest of Iraq this is all a part of our need. Uh, you know, uh, in Kurdistan, we have good reserve, but the reserve is different from the uh, sour to uh, sweet gas. Technically, there is a possibility, and we expect that we see more investment to uh, technically support this kind of uh, gas we have. And uh, we expect to increase the capacity and to uh, invest more and uh, fill the gap first to have gas to power, then to the export and marketing. Yeah, and I think uh, I think we can all envision a future in which uh, the Kurdistan region is able to provide natural gas as an exporter regionally, either to to federal Iraq or to its neighbors, and also uh, provide regions even within Kurdistan that don't even don't currently have gas, uh, uh, such as places like Dahuk. Um, and so, Russell, Adam, uh, would you would you be ready to comment on? Uh, is there a role for you mentioned the EPC uh, EPC's opportunities to to come in and help treat uh, some of the sour gas, some of the associated gas? Do you see an opportunity in the future where companies could cooperate to to to, to realize a, an aggregated gas market in Kurdistan? I think so. I think it would be logical uh, for the government and operators to work together. You know, in the Northern Fairway, where we are, we have um, three adjacent blocks uh, and a gas solution is, um, a, a, a joint gas solution would make eminent sense. Now, 
on our block, we have um, actually turned over uh, responsibility and the benefits for the ownership and marketing of the gas to the government. And so, um, you know, to the extent um, to the extent financing can be arranged, and um, you know, there could be outside help, uh, we would be uh, we would be willing to uh, help the government any way possible to to move that move that down the road. Okay. That's helpful. And then, and Chris, uh, you noted that the, the resilience of the Kurdish Kurdish people. Uh, um, what is what is Chevron's what is Chevron's future look like uh, going forward? And you mentioned your partnership with Ganel and Ganel being a critical player in the in, in the uh, in the region. What do, what do you envision Chevron's position in Kurdistan looking in the next couple couple of years towards this region? Yeah, I mean that it's that that's. Very difficult to say. I mean, we, we, we like to think at the moment that we have uh, we have sound foundations. Uh, as I said, you know, we 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 have good good partnerships. Uh, we feel welcome. Uh, uh, you know, we're 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 looking to see where the reservoir takes us. Um, but I think one of the one of the critical things, one of the Chevron's mantras at the moment, uh, globally, is you've got to succeed in any environment. So you've got to succeed whatever the price whatever the COVID conditions, uh, uh, whatever the operating environment. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a critical approach. So for us, it's, it's, it's a very clear mindset. Um, we feel that we have strong foundations. We have sound foundations in, 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 in Kurdistan. Um, and we're, we're, we're prepared to succeed. We're prepared to go forward uh, and to, to see what we can do in any environment. OK. Thank you for that, Chris. And uh, I think we need to, to uh, get the program back on its time track. And so um, I greatly appreciate and I'm honored to uh, host today's panel. And I and thank you all for coming. Jake Boz, Russell Freeman, uh, Chris Bowers, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an important it's an important discussion to have on the current state of the of the Kurdistan energy sector, the oil and gas resources that are there and the opportunities that lie ahead. Um, and the challenges that need to be surmounted in order to achieve those the, those those uh, opportunities. And so I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I think now we're going to turn things over to Dr. Hameen Murkan from the University of Kurdistan Howler for an interview with Her Excellency Bagard Talabani, the Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources. Thank you. Good day, Degar Khan. Good day, Dr. Mekhan. Welcome to the conference on post-COVID-19 economic priorities in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. We thank the organizers of this important conference, which has been organized by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Kurdistan Regional Government representation in the United States. As Your Excellency knows, this panel is about prioritizing food security in the Kurdistan region. We have 15 minutes. If you permit, Madam Minister, I will ask questions and you may have three to four minutes to answer for each question. For sure, this panel has its own significant and many people and companies and American investors want to hear about the plans of the Ministry of Agriculture. Please allow me, Madam Minister, to ask the first question, which is about the level and state of the agriculture sector in general. And during this pandemic, has the KRG strategy witnessed any changes in this critical sector or has it stayed the same? Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Mr. Steve Lutz, the KRG representation in the United States and American companies that are with us now. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a grave situation all over the world and in Kurdistan as well. This is a new situation for our people. 
who were in lockdown or had to stay home in quarantine. Many people went back to their villages and farms in rural areas and started farming. When this happened in Kurdistan region, it was the harvest season and a time for agricultural activities for farmers and agribusiness owners. We, as the KRG, stepped in. The KRG, especially the ninth cabinet's policy, has put emphasis on the agriculture sector as a key sector and as a great source of income and economic growth for Kurdistan, in addition to other sectors, of course. We at the ministry supported our farmers and provide all the necessary facilitation for them. As a result, this year's crop yields compared to previous years was much greater in the internal market. Definitely, both we, people and KRG in the Kurdistan region were able to help and we could coordinate with the Iraqi federal government. As you know, Kurdistan region got a fertile land. We have approximately three and a half million donum of agricultural land. The climate is such that 50% of our agricultural land is guaranteed to be watered by rainfall. 35% is likely to get sufficient rainfall and 15% is not guaranteed to have enough rainfall. We have a good workforce in Kurdistan in general. We, as KRG, have been able to implement many important projects, despite the financial challenges and the coronavirus pandemic. Although we have had all these issues, we've been able to take some important steps. The biggest step was to find local market for the wheat harvest of Kurdistan's farmers. Through the private sector, the KRG annually purchases 500,000 tons of wheat from the farmers. We also established 13 different processing manufacturing companies in order to safeguard food for our internal market and at the same time to purchase our farmers' products. At the same time, in the coming days, we will lay the foundation stone for building a sugar beet processing plant which will provide jobs for 8,000 farmers. This will create thousands of job opportunities from wheat marketing as well as running the beet sugar processing plant. We also provided full support to our poultry farms, supported fish farms and livestock, poultry and all other fields. The strategy of the KRG for the agriculture sector is to make it one of the pillars of Kurdistan region's economy. Right now, our aim is for people to depend on themselves as individuals and farmers instead of relying on the public sector. Thank you for this information. This takes us to our second question. What is KRG's policy in general and the Ministry of Agriculture in particular to increase and attract foreign investment and capital, especially from America? Plus, what is the KRG's view and strategy on importing American technology and new equipment to help implement the strategy that you have outlined? I want to point out something important here. Right now, Kurdistan region is an untapped market for those countries that have large companies and capital which they can invest here. It is true that we have a lot of production but one of the issues that we have is the marketing of those local productions, which means we have not taken big steps in the area of agro-food industry. We are at the early stages. This opens the door for big countries, especially a leading country like the United States and its investors to invest here, establish large industrial factories. When these American companies come, they will bring the latest agricultural technology and equipment that our farmers want to use. As I mentioned, due to the financial crisis, the KRG hasn't been able to import the latest agricultural technology and equipment. And really, 
We haven't had much support from the central government to enable us to benefit from international loans or from the federal government's funds. The KRG in the past few weeks decided to waive taxes and fees for big companies on their imports of modern agricultural machinery. To this end, a committee has been formed from the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Interior. Another point is, if those who invest in establishing large agro-food factories cannot find the raw materials they need in Kurdistan, once again we will waive custom fees so they can import them. We also provide land for investors where they can build their plots. We have the will to develop the agriculture sector and agro-food industry. In every province, we have allocated an area for food industry zone, which opens the door for investors to bring their capital to the Kurdistan region. I think it will be very important to bring modern technology, especially from America. The theme of this conference is about that. My third question is, during the current financial hardship that Kurdistan region and Iraq generally, like the rest of the world, are going through, is there a program or strategy for PPP, private-public partnership? If there is one, can you shed some light on this for American companies and investors? As you know, there are mechanisms for partnership between public and private sectors everywhere in the world. For example, when a government is not able to implement a project due to financial limitations, that's when the private sector can step in and fill the gap. We at the KRG, as decided by the Council of Ministers, have decided to implement a mechanism for partnership between the public sector, meaning the KRG, and the private sector, and to provide the opportunity for investors and companies that have expertise in the field to step in. We in the Ministry of Agriculture and Water Resources plan to take advantage of this type of partnership for different projects. First, building dams. We have prepared plans for building nine big and strategic dams in the Kurdistan region. And we will definitely need the know-how of international companies and their involvement. We can open doors for companies that are way ahead of Kurdistan region in this field by using this mechanism. The KRG has formed a high committee to this end, which includes His Excellency Prime Minister, His Excellency Deputy Prime Minister, the Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Finance and other inline ministries to look into the proposals from companies who want to invest in this area. Another thing we are working on in our ministry is implementing big irrigation projects, taking advantage of ground water resources to irrigate our farms, which would benefit vast agricultural areas. This will help keep droughts away and keep us away from a crisis that the entire world is afraid of, which is desertification. We can keep our country green and our farmers can reuse our water resources. This is another project that we want to implement through PPP. Madam Minister, when we look into the work done by your ministry and the website of your ministry, you put a lot of emphasis on domestic production, which makes our citizens very happy in the Kurdistan region. In your opinion, Madam Minister, what is the role of American investors to help in implementing this strategy, as this point is very important? As I said, this could be an important role. We need support from the United States with its capital, and as I said, we for sure need U.S. companies in Kurdistan for investment. Any company, whether local or foreign ones, like American companies, when they invest in Kurdistan, we emphasize on two or three points. First, 
increasing tax on imports, especially from neighboring countries, and this will help local companies that work on the development of agricultural industry. When we raise taxes on imports, this will give more opportunities for their products to be sold in Kurdistan as well as the rest of Iraq. At the same time, we have decided that if the production of those companies and factories that are being established meet the needs of our market, we will ban imports of those products from entering Kurdistan. To this end, we have taken several steps. We are now in the process of preparing a contract to be signed with both agro-food factories in Kurdistan. In order, they will provide tomato seeds to our farmers and at the same time in the harvesting season, they will be able to buy most of the tomato production that has been flooding the market every year. And they will process them in their agro-food factory and they will supply local market with whatever they produce from the processing of tomato. We have made all the necessary facilitation for these factories and similar companies working in the field of agro-food industry who use local productions as a raw material. We are providing them with electricity at a subsidized price. We also put a ban on importing production and materials that are produced by those factories and we will increase tax on those imports for sure. So, you're protecting American investors that want to invest in Kurdistan in the field of agriculture? Sure, of course. All the things I mentioned are there in the investment law, and we have good contact with the Kurdistan Board of Investment since we complement each other's work. For sure, when amending the law, we will emphasize the agriculture sector and that there will be support for companies that want to invest in agriculture. As I said, all customs fees will be waived when they import the necessary material for establishing their agro-food factories and all the raw materials they need. Madam Minister, I will make this question my last question, and then you will have one minute for final comments and observations. How is the cooperation and coordination between the Iraqi government and the KRG in the agricultural sector? And do you think the laws and programs are good? What plans do you have for better cooperation with the Iraqi federal government in general? Our relations with the Iraqi government and especially with the Iraqi Ministry of Agriculture and Water Resources are very good. We have a joint committee which takes the necessary actions. For sure, sometimes problems may arise, but we try to overcome them during our visits to the Iraqi Federal Government's Ministry of Agriculture. And there is also a special representative of our ministry at our Iraqi counterpart ministry to solve issues and the joint committee that I mentioned. We make sure to facilitate coordination between us in regard to investment and attracting foreign investors, especially investors from big countries like America to Kurdistan region. I'm sure the Iraqi government will support us in this since we share the same market. Agricultural products in Kurdistan and those that are produced in Iraq are compiled in a list that we work on together according to a mechanism that we call the Agricultural Gazette. This is a journal of agricultural production that is harvested and when a type of crop is ready for harvesting in the center or south of Iraq, the federal government will ban the import of that crop. The same with us, when a crop is harvested, we ban the import of that product. This will enable us to trade and exchange production among ourselves. So the gains we make are shared and the KRG and Iraqi governments are partners. And we really want the agricultural sector to take such a path that we don't send our money abroad to buy the same crops that we produce ourselves. And so that we protect our food security and the food producers. As we all know, and as I mentioned, especially Kurdistan region, which lies in the northern part of Iraq, is considered the food basket for the country. We have all the requirements 
fertile lands, water resources, workforce, but we need support. We need a lot of capital in order for us to use the resources, the lands, water and workforce. Most of the water resources that we use for agriculture come from within the Kurdistan region. This could help in depending on ourselves for protecting our food security and water security. I say it again, this region is an untapped market where we can establish many agricultural projects and this is an opportunity for large companies to invest here. Uh, the relationship between Kurdistan region and the United States is deep-rooted and strategic, both at the government level and at the grassroots level. The people of Kurdistan love the U.S. government and people of America. I think the program you have will be positively embraced. You have one more minute if you have anything else you want to say as we conclude. This debate and this meeting together and the opening of this door by the KRG for American investors and big companies, uh, thankfully the involvement of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in this event in itself means that they are interested in Kurdistan region. This is a great opportunity for us in the Ministry of Agriculture and Water Resources to talk about the geographical location of our region, which they are familiar with, and the relations between our two governments, KRG, and the great country like the United States is very good. We open our door to them again and ask them to cooperate with us and support the KRG with capital and in investment in different sectors especially agriculture, which we wish to make one of the foundations for our economy, like other sectors, because there are other U.S. companies that work in the oil sector and other sectors in Kurdistan. But we in the KRG, at our ministry, in the ninth cabinet, the prime minister and the deputy prime minister have stressed that it is very important for us to work on this sector, to develop what is a sector that can provide tens of thousands of job opportunities to people in Kurdistan, to fresh college graduates. At the same time, develop the sector and the villages, all of which can play a role in enabling people to depend on themselves and to develop their own lives to make a living. Madam Minister Begar Talabani, Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources of the KRG, Thank you for your participation in this conference and for shedding light on prioritizing food security in Kurdistan. Well, thank you, Minister Talabani and Dr. Mirkan, for your overview of the agriculture sector in the Kurdistan region of Iraq and the importance of food security. Uh, you, you mentioned the U.S. Chamber's commitment to this relationship, and please know uh, that we look forward to working with you for a deeper relationship and ties in the agriculture and with American food companies. I'd also mention on a personal note, uh, my dad just sent me recently uh, my new John Deere hat, and uh, I grew up on a farm. I'm a farm boy at heart, farming's, farming's family, and I personally look forward to uh, seeing what we can do uh, to increase our ties in this important sector. Uh, pivoting to our, our next speaker, I'm really excited to welcome to the conference uh, Allison Miner, Managing Director for the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Uh, Allison, thank you for being with us today and participating in this speed round. I know you and your CEO, Adam Bowler, were with us in August when we welcomed um, the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, Prime Minister Akadami, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you today. And let me just jump right into it and, and, and start by asking if, if you could share with us what is the mission of uh, the USDFC? 
Thanks so much, Steve, and uh, for hosting this event and, and for having us here today and at the event in, in August. Um, start off for those who aren't aware, DFC is a new agency um, in the terms of US government agencies. We were just formally stood up last year. We were charged by a bipartisan group in Congress with three main goals. The first is to advance economic development, private sector led development in lower and middle income countries across the globe. The second is to advance US foreign policy. And the third is to generate returns for the US taxpayer, not necessarily to money, but instead to ensure the sustainability of our projects and to respect US tax taxpayer dollars. To achieve these goals, we were given uh, more resources, tools, and greater flexibility. So our global exposure cap was more than doubled to 60 billion globally. globally. And we were given new equity investment and technical development support tools in addition to the debt and political risk insurance that our predecessor agency, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation had. We also, I think, is, uh, which is important, have greater flexibility in the level of US company participation in projects, uh, particularly highly impactful or strategic projects, which opens up opportunities for us that we could not have pursued before. And finally, the USAID Development Credit Authority Office was merged into DFC, and this now creates an office that is specifically charged with pursuing joint programming with USAID and create some exciting opportunities for using blended finance models for high impact projects and to build on the, the work that USAID is doing globally. Given our new mandate, DFC is not just focused on expanding our investment, but really to broaden our partner base and, and to work closely with the re rest of the US G government to support high impact and, and strategic projects. We do require projects to be bankable, to, to have a viable commercial model, but we don't expect to make market returns. We seek to be additional and to come in in projects where private sector financing is, is not available or viable. And ideally by our participation, we hope to actually help crowd in additional investment, including from the private sector. And we have the benefit of uh, extremely long tenors and as well as competitive rates on our debt financing. It's probably easier to talk about what DFC doesn't do as opposed to what we do do, given that our, our flexibility is, is so broad. We can support all the way from direct financing to businesses that are just uh, merging onto profitability through our portfolio for impact innovation, um, all the way up to, uh, up to $1 billion in debt for major infrastructure, or other project finance structures. Uh, thank you for that that overview, Allison. As a new entity, I know it's it's always helpful, I think, for people to understand kind of what your mandate is. And it's really interesting to hear of that flexibility and kind of that dynamic approach you're able to bring to the table in partnering with the private sector. So thank you for that. Um, pivoting specifically uh, to to the to uh, the discussion at hand, can you share with us any any plans or priorities that the DFC has to engage uh, Iraq as well as the Kurdistan region of Iraq? Definitely. So Iraq is a priority for DFC, as we saw with the signing of the MOU back in August. Not only do we think of Iraq as a really critical regional economic player, we've also been heartened by some of the steps the government has taken to improve the business enabling environment and create meaningful opportunities for the private sector. And we want to build on that momentum as we see these reforms is absolutely critical. Um, the MOU was, was directed at, uh, specifically at this purpose. And we've been heartened by some of the progress that we've seen from the government of Iraq on some of the conditions that were laid out in that MOU. Uh, but DFC is specifically excited about investment in the Kurdistan region. Um, as has been discussed previously, we're, we're very excited by the steps that the KRG has taken to improve the climate for the private sector and to improve security. And we think that uh, DFC investments in this region could actually serve as a model that we hope to then expand out to the rest of Iraq. Um, we are particularly interested in pursuing energy projects in, in the um, region. I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made about the potential for gas to power and, and potentially even for export and would love to support further projects in, in that space. Um, but we also want to support the government's efforts to diversify the, the economy. So following the meetings in August, we've had a, an opportunity to have some consultations with representatives here in Washington to identify priority sectors such as agriculture, um, healthcare and access to finance. We're also working closely with USAID uh, to build on the great work that they've been doing to support post-ISIS recovery in the region, 
particularly related to economic recovery and support to small businesses. Um, across the country, we're also looking uh, for opportunities to support projects that are aligned with our Women's Economic Empowerment Initiative, which we call 2X. 2X is one of the top priorities for DFC globally um, because we think that empowering women economically is essential to the economic viability of a, of a country. So to be aligned with our 2X initiative, projects have to be um, have to have a significant proportion of women in senior management or, or other meaningful uh, positions within the company or to produce a product or service that that specifically benefits women. Well, you provided a lot for us to think about there, but the note you ended on, I think, on the 2X program and having that inclusive approach to making sure that half or more of the population uh, is engaged, you know, in these commercial investment opportunities is, is absolutely pivotal uh, to having sustained economic growth and a, and a vibrant future uh, in the region of Iraq and Iraq and the Middle East overall. So applaud the FC for that effort. Um, Allison, one final question. Can you share any uh, early success stories or recent announcements or any, any lasting message you'd like to leave with our viewers? Thanks, Steve. So DFC was very excited to finalize our loan to HKN Energy for their project, their processing facility in Sarsang last year. Uh, this was actually our first um, major energy project in the region, uh, but we hope it is the, the first of many because we think it is a, exactly the kind of opportunity uh, for um, the private sector to really get engaged in the sector and, and improve the efficiency, which we think is absolutely critical. Um, I don't have anything additional to announce right now, but please, uh, you know, stay tuned to this space because we are working on uh, a few other projects related to energy, healthcare, and access to finance that we hope to be able to announce very soon. And I, I would put in one final plug uh, that DFC's work ultimately depends on the private sector. We need private sector partners to come to us with opportunities, um, and then we can work with them to, to get them ready for DFC support. So. Please, um, we've heard a lot of exciting um, progress during during this event today and, and would love to explore additional opportunities in all of the sectors that have been discussed. Well, Allison, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a busy day to be with us. And, and you know you can count on the U.S. Chamber to be a closely aligned partner with the DFC and we do very much look forward to working with you uh, in all things Iraq and the Kurdistan region of Iraq and really across the Middle East region. So thank you so very much for spending time with us. We will absolutely stay tuned uh, for future updates. Thank you very much. And that closes out our, our final session. And I'll ask uh, a couple of uh, good friends to join me uh, for final reflections momentarily. Well, hello, Rob. Hi, Bayan. Um, we're in our in our final in our final stretch here, and I'm really delighted to be joined by both of you. And let me let me just thank both of you, um, Bayan, for being our, our partner in this event. And we really do appreciate everything that you and Tara and the entire team have done uh, to make this possible. And and Rob, uh, I'll, I'll thank you and, and the consulate there in Erbil, and really uh, all your partners across the USG uh, for all your efforts. And Rob, let me come to you first. For any thoughts, uh, final reflections uh, as we look to conclude uh, this two-day conference. Rob, do we have you? Steve, and I seem to be having some. Yeah, I think we're we're having some connectivity issues on this end. Can you hear me? Okay. Sure, can. Yes, thank you very much. You're all set. Okay, terrific. Well, let me take this opportunity to um, once again thank the U, especially you, Steve, and your colleagues, Sami Abdul Rahman, for all the hard work and preparation that you put into hosting this incredibly useful and I think informative um, session. And I want to thank as well all of our panelists who participated. It was a really impressive slate of speakers, both from the US government and the Kurdistan regional government, as well as from the private. Um, and I guess for me, the, the key takeaway from everything that we've heard over the past two days is that there is an 
opportunities is do business here in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Um, a few highlights from today's session. You know, PDAS Joey Hood spoke earlier today about our efforts to help the Kurdistan region evolve from a regulatory environment to an enabling environment. And I thought our ministerial panel today did a really excellent job unpack that concept a little bit and talking about the details of what doing in order to streamline processes and, and create that more enabling environment. I thought it was very encouraging. Um, likewise, I thought the energy panel did a, a fantastic job of, of assessing you know, key challenges and opportunities within the energy sector, which as we all know, really is the driving force behind the, the economy here at the moment. Um, uh, Her Excellency Minister Tani's um, present on food security and water security um, was really, really intriguing. And I strongly agree with her sense that there's a lot of untapped potential here in the Kurdistan region. And then finally, I just wanted to echo one of the comments that Dr. Hemen made when he talked to the, um, the love fest, in the Kurdish public and, and the Kurdistan and, and the United States. Um, I know it's difficult to, um, to put a number on, on goodwill um, as accountants in our, our audience can attest, but I certainly wouldn't underestimate the value of the goodwill that exists for the United States and for US companies here in the Kurdistan region. There's just an immense reservoir of, of goodwill and affection. And I think it's a true asset for looking to do business here. In conclusion, um, just one, one quick message for any US companies that are in the audience and that are thinking about doing business here. We'd like you to um, consider the consulate's economic section as your partner for any commercial advocacy needs. We take that our mandate very seriously, which is why we're also working to develop the AmCham Kurdistan branch to be a resource for you as well. So on behalf of the U.S. government and, and for my colleagues here, Bill, as well as, as at Embassy Baghdad, um, I want to thank you for, for your question today and encourage you to, um, to reach out to us. You'll find us to be willing and eager partners um, looking to empower your success here in the Kurdistan region. Thank you. Well, Rob, thank you and, and Lisa and the entire team there so very much. And you, you're right to uh, basically steer companies to you. And uh, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, we know how important it is uh, to help our nascent uh, Anchams grow. So we, we appreciate you uh, giving them a shout out as well. And I, you made so many good points, but I have to say, uh, the point of goodwill uh, is is so um, so important and so ubiquitous that uh, we are pushing on an open door, and, and that's such an important takeaway. Bayan Khan Zorospas, thank you for all of your leadership and all that you put in to make this conference possible. Would love to get your key takeaways and, and any final thoughts you might have on how we go forward. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Rob. Um, I really appreciate what Rob said. I think um, his points about uh, the, the various uh, things that the minister said uh, and people like Joey Hood said are very important. Um, so first, actually, I would like to thank you, Steve, and Anna Burris, your colleague, and other colleagues at the US Chamber. You've been incredibly helpful, uh, imaginative partners to have on this conference. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my own team, uh, the KRG team here in Washington, DC. Uh, it's been great to work with you and I'm, I'd like to thank uh, all of them as well. Um, and particularly Tara Hamawandi, who has worked very closely with you and Anna on this. Um, Another thank you is to Rudal. Uh, Rudal Television has been our media partner for this conference. We really appreciate their cooperation. I think it's important that not only American companies can see this conference, but also uh, our people in Kurdistan. Uh, I think it's important that they understand our relationship with the United States is strong and it's growing stronger and it's widening 
we're going into new areas and new fields and uh, the goodwill that Rob and you have mentioned is important. And those of us here in America, we see a lot of goodwill from Americans towards Kurdistan. Uh, of course, from American officials and members of Congress, but also from the public. I think the goodwill goes both ways. So more thank yous uh, from me. Uh, I would like to thank all of the American officials uh, and companies that took part in this conference. They all gave us their time, their insights, their experience. We really appreciate that. I'd like to thank all of the KRG officials who took part, the prime minister, deputy prime ministers, all of the ministers and other friends and colleagues from Kurdistan who took part. And uh, final thank you to those American companies that have already invested in Kurdistan. Your investments have helped Kurdistan uh, get where it is today and we appreciate your faith in us and we hope that you will stay the course and I would like to welcome American companies to take Kurdistan as an untapped open market the door is open for you please contact us here at the minute uh, at the representation in Washington DC or the investment board in Kurdistan and of course Rob also offered the US consulate in Erbil. So with that, Steve, uh, thank you again, and I'll hand over back to you. Well, uh, Bayan Khan, a spe special thanks to you and to uh, Tara Khan. Thank you so much for partnering with us on this event. I would echo uh, your appreciation to all of the KRG officials, the, the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, uh, foreign minister, uh, Deze, all of the ministers that participated um, and a special thanks as well to uh, Kapdara and the Federation of Kurdistan Chambers. Of course, um, our good friend, uh, Ambassador Farid Yassin, uh, here in Washington, D.C., and all of the USG speakers, ranging from uh, the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Energy to Ambassador Tuller, uh, today to uh, PDAS Zeiss, uh, Das Kapli, um, and the entire Iraq Dust team at State. Uh, we thank all of you, and of course, again, uh, Consul General Rob Waller. And I also want to extend our appreciation to all of the participating companies that spoke and all of our moderators, and a special thanks to our council co-chairs, uh, Hillwood and HKN Energy, as well as ExxonMobil. And uh, of course, uh, as Bayan mentioned, a special note of appreciation to our media partner, Rudaw, and for live streaming this conference. And I have to thank uh, my, my colleague, partner in crime, uh, Anna Burris, who spent her birthday actually uh, working to finalize uh, the, the, con the conference logistics and Jamil Kaur on our team and the entire production and AV team at the, at the U.S. Chamber for their long hours and dedication to making this thing a success. We really do appreciate that. And I'd just like to end on a note that our conference, of course, is taking place uh, two days before here in the United States. Uh, we'll celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and it's a time, of course, traditionally to come together with family and friends and enjoy good food course, a little football. It's also a time to reflect on uh, what's important and what 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 you're thankful for, uh, something we should probably do more often, myself included. So I would encourage our extended family uh, there in the Kurdistan region and across all of Iraq to reflect on what is important. And I know I'm grateful for having the privilege to work with so many committed leaders in business and in government to strengthen our economic ties. And I'd ask all of us uh, to take time to renew our determination as we look, uh, look ahead to 2021 and commit to working together to bringing about the reforms and the progress that will ultimately lead to a brighter tomorrow for the Kurdistan region and all of Iraq. So Zor Spas, thank you all for tuning in. And with that, we conclude our conference. Thank you.